Good afternoon and welcome to this panel discussion, which is hosted by Owen Mitchell and Hayes. In the next hour, we'll explore the topic of the role of the GC and the company secretary in the rapidly accelerating ESG agenda. My name is Vicky Brackett and I'm the Chief Commercial Officer at Owen Mitchell, leading on our firm's growth strategy and our own ESG or responsible business strategy, which sits right at the heart of our plans. We are going to use Slido throughout this um, session this afternoon. So for those of you who aren't familiar with it, it's an opportunity for audience participation. You can post questions onto the Q&A in the usual way, but we're going to ask a few questions of the audience. For those who haven't used it before, if you go to slido.com in your browser, on your phone or on your computer, and use the hashtag role of the GC, and that will get you in and being able to um, contribute to the questions. And we're also going to post a feedback form at the end of the session, which we'd like you to fill in. And it will give you an opportunity actually to suggest some further deep dives into some topics that you might like to talk about specifically on ESG, because today's session is necessarily going to be at a relatively general level, just trying to explore the role of the general counsel and the company secretary in this ever evolving world. The ESG agenda means very different things to different organisations, as I'm sure you know, and as general counsel and company secretaries, you will all be involved in leading and inspiring and possibly at times cajoling boards to think strategically about the business commitment to environmental, social and governance goals. I was only talking to one company secretary recently who told me the role she had signed up to two years ago was so fundamentally different, both in terms of depth and breadth of what she had to deal with from the one she'd originally started. And I'm sure many of you would that would resonate with you. But we are all at different stages of the journey, depending on the maturity of the business we're involved in and its particular per, per, um, purpose. But many aspects of the plans have been embedded in our businesses for years. So actually, there's a lot of heritage there that we should build upon and try not to be too, too fearful of. I've got a really experienced panel this afternoon and it represents a range of business interests. Um, but what actually has become apparent to me when preparing for this session and in other discussions I've been having with our own clients um, is the consistency of the themes, no matter where a business may be in its evolution, development and execution of the ESG goals. So I'm going to turn to the panel. Um, that's who we're all interested in. Get them all to do a quick introduction. So, Lucy, if I could come to you first, please. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Lucy Clark Bodycoat. I'm the General Counsel and Corporate Services Director of HS1, the UK's currently only high speed railway. Thanks, Lucy and Karen. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Karen Young and I work at Hayes. I am not a GC. Uh, I am a Operations Director at Hayes in the UK and Ireland, um, and I oversee our uh, social and environmental purpose. Brilliant. Thank you, Karen and Lisa. Hi everybody, I'm Lisa Turner. I'm the General Counsel for EMEA and the CIS for Komatsu Mining Corp Group, uh, which is part of the bigger Komatsu Global Organisation. Brilliant, thank you. And last but no means least, least Bruce. Bruce. Good afternoon, my name is Bruce McMillan. I'm the General Counsel of Owen Mitchell it's a Group um, and I'm on the board as one of the board sponsors for Responsible Business. This is what we call ESG within the firm. And I also run the Corporate Secretariat for the group. Thanks, everybody. So real wide range there of, of expertise um, and hopefully some really good insight. But before we're going to kick off, we would, as I say, like to just get some audience views and we're going to ask a couple of questions on Slido. So, James, I don't know if those can go live. So that, that's up live now. So you can see the question there. The research is telling us that ownership of ESG plans and activities is often dispersed across a number of stakeholders. Do you and your team have enough involvement in developing and overseeing the plan? Let's have a look what we can see coming up there. OK. So nobody is suggesting that we should have less involvement. Um, a majority there, just, just a majority in having more involvement. I don't know if one of our panellists wants to comment on that. Perhaps, Lisa, maybe. Um, what's your view from Komatsu's point of view? Do you get enough involvement? Oh, 50-50 now. <laughs> Uh, I, th I think it's very dependent on um, the organisation and how it's set up. Uh, and I think a theme that will come up a lot is, you know, and where you are in that journey of, um, of ESG. So because we're part of a global organisation headquartered in Japan, um, there's a large amount of work that is done at a um, 
at a group sort of corporate level, if you like, in terms of setting the purpose, setting the goals, and, and our organisation is quite mature, I guess, and quite advanced in that, um, which I'm happy to talk to a bit later. But I think because of that, the challenge then becomes involving people on the ground and making sure that it becomes more of a embedding, um, embedding and actioning and embracing kind of role as opposed to that setting, um, you know, that development or, or oversight, I guess. Um, and just, I think it's about having the right level of engagement um, between those functions, those who are setting the strategy and those that are on the ground trying to deliver those those strategies and, and making sure they stay evolved and stay relevant. Yeah, I suspect involvement goes up and down depending on the stage of the evolution of the plan, where we're at, where we're at in terms of, of execution. Interesting, we have got some people who think they should have less involvement. Anyone on the panel believe their involvement's too 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 significant or should be getting less of it? probably got some sympathy that it might feel like you're you're overworked on this because I think it has really added to the role as we were saying at the beginning. Um, Bruce have you got some thoughts on that? Yes I think one of the things about this is actually the focus of the involvement so um, there's certainly times I think where I've wished to have differently focused involvement and perhaps less involvement in some aspects of it than others um, and this is often about helping to get clarity of allocation of roles, clarity of accountability, how you link these things in for example to procurement policies, how you meet up to your uh, own standards to your customers and, and also things like internal policies and processes. So if I did intermittently have a, a wish for less involvement, it wasn't me that voted that incidentally, it would simply be because of the need to get the, ma the mechanisms right better and quicker, which obviously is an ongoing focus for us or with the, the G bit, the governance bit of what we do. I think I think that's really, really um, insightful, Bruce. And I, I think just that prioritisation and making sure that we are focusing on the right things. And we'll come on to that, I think, in the in the conversation. I'm just going to move us on to the second Slido question, if I may, James. I don't know if you can move us on. Yeah, you can see that there now on the screen for those of you who've now got into the Slido mode. We're just interested in your company's top motivation for investing in ESG. And you'll see a whole range of options there. Um, from the regulatory change, um, right thing to do straight away. That's only one person, but um, but I think many of us feel like that. I think you know it is definitely something where it's increasingly becoming seen as not only something that needs to tick a box or to respond to investors or stakeholders, but actually it being the socially right thing to do. But yeah, I can see that investor relations pressure just coming in there. That's there. I mean, it's real, isn't it? I mean, there's, there's the commercial aspects of this. It isn't just um, the nice thing to do. I think there is some real external pressures. Lucy, what would you say from your perspective in looking at um, HS1? Where, where would their, um, their priorities be? I would say all of the above, <laughs> absolutely <laughs> all of those things. Um, I think, you know, it, clearly as a responsible business, it's absolutely the right thing to do. Uh, we all know that there's legislative requirements, but it's actually it's reputational as well. And our investors are interested because we consider ourselves to be a green gateway to Europe. ESG is incredibly important to HS1 and I found recently through recruiting that it's incredibly important to the people that we're interviewing as well. It's a real attraction factor for coming to work with the company. Yeah and you can see that there that's it's getting 11% there but that employer reput reputation and I think again we'll come on to that topic. Karen any observations from you? Some some people saying that their company is not currently motivated to invest and I think we'll talk about that but any observations from Hayes point of view around your motivations? I think it's interesting because if I sort of look at it from a personal perspective when I was um, showcasing this to our board uh, and, and, and again it was the answer was all of the above and more that I had on my list of the reasons why we should do it um, and, and where I've come to on it personally, and it is my personal opinion, is, is that the, the ESG bit, and, and this is just a view, the ESG bit, I think, is, is the pressure from investors. It's the outside looking into your organisation and what that looks and feels like. And where we've taken a view in, in, in the development of what we're doing at Hayes in the UK and Ireland is um, actually to talk about our social and environmental purpose, which I feel is, is more about the, the people within the organisation 
organisation and, and doing the right thing and the fact that um, it comes from within. It's the beating heart of the organisation. So you look inside and, and, and then out. Um, and I think that you know, it helps to get um, people invested in it um, emotionally, um, invested it in terms of their, their roles. Um, but they then kind of got this, this um, sort of contract of responsibility to the organisation they work for to do the right thing. Yeah, brilliant. And I, and I think, um, Karen, that just segues us brilliantly into perhaps the first topic that was sitting there on on our agenda and invitation for this this session. And for me, it's about that purpose and how you link this agenda. So it just doesn't become a thing on the side that shareholders and investors are demanding. How do we make I think the most successful businesses that are really thriving in this space are linking it directly into purpose and wrapping it into their into their strategy. Um, so just moving on, I think the first topic we thought we would cover on here was the just generally the role of in-house counsel and the company secretary in embedding that ESG agenda into the business. And I think, Lisa, when you sent me some comments pre this session, you talked, I think, really sensibly about the maturity of the business on this. And I think one of the things that's come out through various conversations I've been having in, you know, with clients and on similar sessions is, we're all at a different stage and that will depend on the type of industry we're in, the maturity of our business. Um, and I think not being fearful of feeling we're a bit behind and perhaps just looking more positively to what can we learn from those who are a bit further ahead. And I hope this session is going to be able to share some of that wisdom and learnings that we've all had and that people can take some really good takeaways. Um, but I think just not getting too angst ridden about it, being clear, prioritising is really important. So just, just to kick us off, it'd be great to hear from each of you just how that agenda is managed within your business. How Where does that sit across your organisation specifically? Does it sit with the company sector in the GC? What kind of role do they play? So maybe Lucy, if we could start with you, that'd be great. Thanks. Sure, no problem. So it doesn't sit with, with me specifically. We've effectively split up some of the responsibilities amongst all of the senior management team at HS1. Predominantly the engineering director has ownership of the sustainability strategy and that then feeds into our ESG reporting. So I suppose the best way I can describe it is that we have a very collaborative, transparent approach within the organisation. So, so you have actually though got one person that's owning that Yes. But actually, then you've got a team behind that's working all across across the board. Karen, yes. how about at Hayes? I mean, we're, we're a listed PLC and, and ultimately the ESG element of it um, is, is obviously defined at group level across the, the territories around the world. The interpretation of it, you know, for, a, for the part of the business that I, I work for has, has been a, a, appointing me as, as a a, a, as a lead for it, reporting into the board. So again, it's it's board level, it's senior management team. Um, and, and look, I'll be humble, but we're sort of humble beginnings, really, we feel in terms of what we're doing here. In different parts of the world, we've, we've got really structured committees you know, set up, you know, a little bit like we were just talking about, with each with their defined role. Um, and, and ultimately, we are a people business. And so our sort of, our strong leaning on this is the, is the people element of it. What we do, putting 280,000 people into roles that hopefully transform their lives is kind of our purpose anyway. So it's it's been, I think, the, the right thing to allow the business to lead it. But actually, through preparing for this session, I'm certainly going to be taking it away to, to talk to our, our legal counsel as well and, and, uh, and, and involve um, individuals there too. Yeah, I think I, th I think that's I think that's really interesting. And I think the global point and then the local point is fascinating. And Lisa, you mentioned in a few comments pre the session to me, and I've heard it before, actually, from GCs that have got more of a global remit that ESG can mean different things in different jurisdictions. So if you're managing that global organisation, it can absolutely be aligned to purpose. But that translation. So I don't know, Lisa, at Komatsu, sort of who owns that and how have you dealt with that sort of local global conflict, which I suspect mm. arises quite a lot? Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I think um, Komatsu is is quite advanced in there or mature. I guess it's constantly evolving, but it's a, it is quite mature in their journey, and and that's probably because of a couple of things. It it is a a large global organisation. You know, that's over a hundred years old. It work. We we predominantly work in the mining and construction industries, and and those industries have by nature, although it was not not called ESG <laughs> back then. There's always been engagement with community. You've always needed to have, well, for a very long time now, you've needed to have good environmental offset, if you like, to the 
um, to the um, uh, way that which you are running, you know, the mining or, or the business. So I think those sort of um, uh, way of thinking about things and those engagements have been around for quite a long time and, and those expectations exist in the industry and have existed for quite some time. Also, um, because we're a Japanese um, headquartered company, there's a real cultural reputational um, element here where for a very long time, um, the core values of Komatsu have been around making sure that the community, uh, that they support the community and that they do the right, they earn the, rep the trust and reputation of their stakeholders. And so I think point of that is when you're having that you're starting those conversations and those that rhetoric has been around the organization for a long time it's a little bit easier to move into the ESG strategy framework because you've already got people thinking um, in that way because of that you know we, we do have quite a structured approach at that global level and we have a, a sustainability division development division um, and a president of that who sort of I think holistically owns ESG um, across the entire global organisation. And then when they develop their goals and their strategies, it's around, um, they, they use quite nice rhetoric about improving our business by solving ESG issues. And therefore they look at it as it goes arm in arm with growth of the organisation because we're still a business that is required to make money for its stakeholders. And it's a way of sort of making sure that that shows a, an, a parallel importance, I guess, you know, we're going to use solving the problems to help us become a more a more profitable um, long term business. Uh, so so I think at a global level, that's that's all great. But again, the challenge that um, that we've spoken about, Vicky, is making sure that on the ground, your employees in different cultures in different jurisdictions are taking on board that message and are, you know, are acting in a way that does that. And we do that by embedding some of those requirements and, and values in, in our global code of conduct, which we have lots of uh, training, etc. on. We also um, have KPIs which come through to the regions, which are based on certain ESG strategies or trying to solve problems, ESG problems. But what's quite nice is lately there's been in the last couple of years, there's been a few employee engagement um, initiatives where they take a global, it's called like one one global, one Komatsu, uh, and they'll take global problems and encourage people on the ground to come up with solutions for them. So a day in the community or particular fundraising or um, what can you do in this particular plant to drive towards lower emissions or environmental, um, uh, you know, have a positive environmental impact. I think that's really nice because it gives people the ability to buy in and actually to own a bit of that. And I think that's the key challenge. And, it, you know, it's a challenge. I'm not saying we're, <laughs> we've got it down pat, but the real challenge is getting that local buy-in, which at whatever level your, your organisation's at, at whichever stage you are in the journey, if you don't have people buying into it and really committing to it and understanding it and, and embracing it, then it's just a it's just a policy that you know that falls flat. Yeah, I think I think there's 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 so much in there actually. <laughs> and I was no no it's great. I like the bottom up ideas, but I think one thing that you and Karen both brought out there was you know Karen talked about her company's purpose. Um, um, I can't, you said it so eloquently, Karen, about changing people's lives in their ne their next career opportunity feels like that was aligned to your purpose almost before it you know your values are already there and you were talking Lisa at Komatsu how the values um certainly from the Japanese influence were there in terms of being a strong community player and I think where you've got where you can identify that within your organization and start to align some of this to it that's when it becomes a rock solid foundation in the organization rather than as I said right at the beginning it becoming a sideshow and Bruce just coming to you Lastly, I mean, you could talk a bit about uh, Owen Mitchell, how we organise it, but I think that values point really rings true, I would say, from our perspective. Yes, very much so. I mean, I think uh, as a national organisation, um, we've got a sort of mini form, a lot of the points that Lucy's just made and Lucy's made as well. It's very much about how we're, we build up the culture bottom upwards in terms of what we do, the values of the firms so that people do engage in all, all of our offices across all of our services. But it's also about that commercial component and we tend to look at things in four pillars, clients, colleagues, communities, and from my perspective also compliance, the four C's. And within each of those there is a core component of how we look at environment, how we look at sustainability and how we do it um, in terms of 
particular focus for us sustainability and inclusion and it's building that through every aspect of, of what we do so Goldman, what's been mentioned earlier most of our board members have some active ownership for king particularly for responsible business our cto is also involved on the responsible business steering committee so we're seeking to make it um top level engagement um but largely getting integration and engagement as part of our purpose and values across the organization so that people live it breathe it more more importantly want to you know it's the discretionary effort it's the extra mile people go because they believe it's part of how they do the right thing for themselves for their team for the firm for clients and, and that those things all all combine but it's about integrating the package making continual effort on that and um very much making it part of of what we all think and breathe every day and you know it's embodied also in you know our core brand value of about expert hand and human touch and the human touch is the bit that this all all comes through and in what we do so i think it does tie in very much to the the one komatsu type of approach the um the, the values of um hs1 built into the way that you operate and also you know the, the global focus generally and you've got a community of a quarter of a million people to deal with which we haven't quite got those numbers but uh, but it's the same sort of thinking about uh, how, how to build that through and make it work for it, make it work on all levels thanks bruce and I, and I think that point about alignment to values is one that we've all quite vigorously discussed when we met as a pre-meet karen i think you've got a couple of points you wanted to just add in there it's just complementing the conversation really but i think the difference for me if i think about you know what's happened to me on the journey of developing you know my role in this has been I, I had sponsorship on it and advocation from it from the top from the start which was important you know i was i was asked to to, to pick this up uh, and, and develop it what really was the game changer was part way through that process was as we had um, six key strategic priorities in place for our UK and Ireland business um, on, a, on a business plan and we added a seventh which we weren't expecting to do but the seventh is this um, and then uh, the journey that we're experiencing at the moment is how all of those key strategic priorities don't sit on their own in their own right and neither does number seven which is this it's how it underpins and, and, and literally moves into each of the other the other KSPs and, and that is enabling us over time to put in the structure of incentive and motivation through our people to, to really do this and align it with the purpose of what we do and, and the values of the organisation. But that's been a bit of a game changer for, for me and the enablement of mobilising people to, to really get involved and, and, and they care, but you have to also give people the vehicle to be able to do it as part of their of their job and their time. Yeah, I think that I think that's important. So the, the the framework, the empowerment from the top is, I mean, sponsorship from the top is, is critical. I think. Um, but I think there's also a realism. And Lucy, when we were t t chatting ahead, ahead of today, I think you were very passionate. I mean, we talked a little bit about authenticity, and these goals that you know we're all. I think what is coming right from every speaker on the on the panel at the moment finding that authentic goal for your organization that really resonates because this is how we start to embed it what the role of the gc is is embedding this into the organization do you want to talk a little bit from the hs1 point of view i think you've got some um experience of how you decided on your goals and how you, they became realistic and authentic for your staff but also of course for the outside world so people believed in those yeah yes of course so I think the most important thing was that we started off from a position of full transparency with the team and we included the team in helping us set the goals. We also onboarded um, a consultancy that helped us set our priorities and then helped us drill down then to the various targets that we were going to have. So we, we ended up with six priority areas and then had various different targets under those priority areas. But as we went along each step of that journey, we again circled back to the wider team. So literally every single person that works for HS1 had the opportunity to input into our sustainability strategy. And that's really helped embed the strategy and ESG within the organisation because everybody feels that they have some ownership of it. I have to say that the team seem very enthusiastic about it. We, we recently attended um, COP26, we're an official partner for the World Climate Summit, the Investment COP, and we brought some of the younger members of the team alongside so they could actually be involved and they found it an exciting development opportunity, but it also helped 
the rest of the organisation get excited about it. And I think the key takeaway for me from all of this is we wouldn't have been invited to be a partner if our sustainability strategy and our journey was not authentic. And I think we're so passionate about ESG at HS1. I think people can soon see through that if you're not being authentic. And I think it's really important to not just kind of talk the talk, but you've got to walk the walk as well, because we have to demonstrate that we're delivering on what we said we we're going to do. So actually last week was quite exciting for us because we issued our first ESG report. And we've set out there where we are in terms of our targets and what we're going to do for the financial year ending in 2023. And again, it's just kind of putting your money where your mouth is and, and showing that you, you are prepared to do the things you say you're going to do. Yeah, and I, th I think making it really accessible as well, not only to your employees where, and we'll come on to talk about the generation coming through where this is critical. And I know Karen, from a Hayes perspective, there's lots to say around that and recruitment. But I think, you know, also your external stakeholders, it's got to seem credible, hasn't it? Otherwise, the, you, you just lose credibility so quickly. So I think the GC and the company secretary shaping that, challenging the board a little bit on prioritisation. And Bruce, when we, we chatted as well about the role of the GC and just horizon scanning Scan a little bit for the board, the board just, just obviously, obviously keeping it authentic, keep it authentic, but how do you look ahead? Yeah, absolutely. Because I think one of the most important bits about the role of the, the GC generally and also the COSEC in respect of company law, company governance is actually thinking ahead because a lot of what we deal with is legislation that's going to take time to adapt the organisation for, time to implement, time to embed. We all know that the, the judgment of what we do now will be made in six or seven years time when those things come home to roost. So really the standards that apply to what we do now are the standards of seven years time with hindsight looking back at us. And so getting those things right in terms of thinking ahead is really important. And yeah, ultimately, as the general counsel role is about um, making sure we're on top of law and regulation generally and how they're going, that's going to be applied and brought into the legislation, uh, effectively applied to the organisation so the organisation runs compliantly. That also applies to these areas and values, whether it be formal leg legislation around modern slavery, about reporting in the Companies Act, um, about those sort of areas or more general trends and indications. So I think for us as in our community of general counsel and COSEC, if we think about the skills that we should have and should be applying for the business anyway on the law and regulation, we can also widen those into what trends are emerging. How do we use those to look at factors that are becoming important? Because they're often coming out of the same sort of environments, the legislative chambers, the policy frameworks and areas like uh, policy making areas that turn into law. So our role, our core role about making sure the business is ready for law that comes along, critical to get that right and critical to look at it more widely around the wider ESG agenda, whether it be procurement, whether it be new law for clients, whether it be new law for the business operations itself. Brilliant, thank you, Bruce. Bruce. And I think we've, we, you know, I think it's bringing into sharp focus for me the role of the GC at board level. You've all talked about top-down sponsorship, you've all talked about it being understandably driven at, at board level. You've all got a voice there, you're an influencer there, you're an advocate there. I think creating business value, Lisa, um, is really important. The board need to be convinced of that. Do you, want, do you want to share a couple of examples of how you've done that at Komatsu from your position just to demonstrate that business value of ESG? Yeah, I think um, I think it's always more helpful to you when you're trying to embed and sell and champion um, these strategies is when that you can display value um, that those um, give you. And it's not necessarily um, financial value, but some very tangible um, value, like Lucy was talking with the partnering. You know, and again, that whole that's that's the difference between you when you have an authentic strategy that you're actually able to take out um, to external stakeholders and and um, put into what you're doing. You're going to start to see that value come back, which you you will not see value come back if you're just if you've just got a policy that you're not really doing anything with. Um, one example that was really good for us to be able to and from the legal team to be able to show the organisation and actually get everyone engaged with from, um, you know, at all levels of the organisation was we're currently negotiating a, a global agreement, supply agreement with a major mining company 
and they have um, their own obviously ESG agenda and one of those uh, requirements in their strategy is they will not now engage with partner with suppliers who don't not just that you need to have an ESG strategy you need to partner with them in an agreement to develop ESG moving forward so you need to both work together and say these are, are our joint goals for how we could jointly contribute to solving ESG issues and these are the particular ones we're going to identify and then as I said it's true money where your mouth is stuff you know we are actually then it's a it's a contract that we have to um, comply with and that and it's a really I thought that was a really really good way of showing them unless we are serious about this unless we actually embody it and bring it into everything we do unless we're, will, we're willing to set these strategies and then work collaboratively with somebody to develop them um, then we're not going to we're not going to be a preferred supplier. We're not going to um, get this business. You know, it's critical business um, for us. But also, it shows that other organisations have that mindset as well. So it helps you kind of sense check with your organisation. It is right for us to be making this a priority because other people are making it a priority as well. Yeah, I, th I think that I think that's really important. We definitely seeing with our own clients that need for collaboration, and it's good, isn't it? I mean, we're collaborate. We're in the, in the legal industry. We're collaborating with other law firms. There's an, a lot of benefit from learning from each other, which goes right back to my opening comments, which is let's not be afraid of admitting we might not know all of the answers, because frankly, no one does, um, and we can all learn from each other. And I think collaborating with suppliers, with clients, with customers with your employees, we've talked about all of that. That's how we're all gonna learn and we're gonna get that authenticity and that embedding into the business. We have had a question just from the audience, which I think is just building on the conversation we've been having. And um, we've got a, 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 a general counsel um, who's working for a global business across time zones, languages, laws. Just any tips or suggestions on creating a cohesive vision um, and shared goals on ESG, particularly about training. I don't know, I mean, Lisa, Sorry to come to you, but I suspect <laughs> you might be the, the best, most, you might have the most analogous position to the, to the <laughs> person that's asked that question. Yeah, I, th I think a, a couple of things. Um, we've set up a couple of online portals. So for particular things like your World Environment Day or um, what you can, photo competitions, um, you know, sharing what you've been doing at a local level. And we, we've done that through a portal so that people can go in there in, in their own time and share that and see um, how their contribution is also building to the global contribution. So they'll say, you know, 100,000 trees planted, you know, which takes into account every um, every region that, that's that been updating the portal, et cetera. So, so something like that's quite good, I think, to um, get people on time, real real time engagement, but also taking into account the different time zones. I think um, online sessions, if you're prepared to run a couple of them across different time zones, I think that's um, that's quite helpful. But I also think having champions on the ground who are sort of putting a consistent voice across, you know, so you engage if you're if you're coordinating it or um, having a, a key role in it, you pick and engage with certain champions on the ground in the different areas, and then they have some ownership where they go out and. Um, engage in the employees and um, build some initiatives and come and report back into that sort of global group. And I think that's quite a nice way of having that global touch, but making sure that on the ground it's being transmitted in the way that's suitable for the organisation on the ground. Yeah, that's great. And Karen, I think you wanted to just come in on that as well from a Hayes point of view. Yeah, I, I'm just in terms of how we've got things structured, we have a global steer co on, on this and, and you know, I represent the UK and Ireland on it um, and we come together usually about every six weeks or so and, and where that's headed is we have two or three key things that we are trying to do globally so we're obviously updating on that and sharing how we're getting traction on it but we are also you know we're i would say hayes is an entrepreneurial corporate you know things are different in one part of the world to another so um just a couple of weeks ago we did the first one of these but we agreed we'd do a regional overview so each territory would overview what we're doing how we're achieving it how we're getting traction through the business um, and that was really interesting I, I i got the first slot up but then listening to the second one we ran we're running two per session um, I learned an awful lot from the second session of that in in what the team was doing very differently in another part of the world so we got consistency of two or three main things globally but then learning from each other from from ways of doing things in different parts of the world great thank you I think those practical examples really help I'm going to move us on just slightly on topic now I think we've covered 
a huge amount there, but we, we have specifically within the invitation, we talked about just building ESG into our risk management plans. We've talked already about collaboration and how we can learn what other industries are doing. And um, we, we've done a survey recently um, in collaboration with the Legal 500, where 85% of the GCs that we interviewed confirmed that they had incorporated ESG into their risk and resilience plans, which is probably not a huge surprise. But I think just practically, that's, that's quite a big job to do. So I just wondered whether there were tips, Lucy, perhaps I could come to you on this, just tips on how you've done that. Um, and perhaps Bruce will come on to you as well. Just how you guys have done that um, and just some practicalities that people were thinking about doing this and approaching it and just not quite sure where to start or they're a long way down the line and they want to tweak it. Any any advice? Yeah, so, so I'm responsible for risk management in, in HS1 actually. So we we do risk reviews, uh, Lisa mentioned champions, so so we have risk champions within the organisation and it's really helped to, again, embed risk management across the company. And so we challenged each of the risk champions to sit down with their teams and talk about ESG risks, sustainability risks. And as a result of that, we have actually made some changes to our corporate risk register. I think there are so many different elements to ESG um, we already had things on our risk register that partly covered it. So we went through a process of identifying things that might feed into it so that we could drill down to a specific risk or risks that we needed to include on the register. So, for example, non-compliance with legislation is, is down as a risk. So that would capture the legislative requirements of ESG. And so we just had to really challenge ourselves as to what we thought the other practical risks were and again that was something that was discussed on a company-wide level as well so again it was just encouraging as much engagement as possible I should I should just make the point by the way that HS1 is not that large a company so we have circa 55 employees so I recognise that it is somewhat easier for us to do that. Yeah but we've we've got businesses of all different sizes on the session today and I think I think what was really resonating with me is we've got global through to smaller company when we were prepping for this. The themes are exactly the same and the challenges are actually as real. And frankly, sometimes I think, Lucy, in the smaller organisations where you haven't perhaps got the investment pots, these things can be a little bit hard. I mean, we've heard about the global challenges in Hayes and in Komatsu, which I'm not going to underestimate at all. But I think sometimes there are different challenges and the tensions are uh, they're all they're all still they're all still there. But Bruce, you you look after our risk and compliance um, at Owen Mitchell, and I know that well. So do you want to just give a little view from the Owen Mitchell point of view? Yes, certainly. And I think just building your last point, Vicky, just reminded me of some years back having doing a procurement exercise and having a survey response from a sole person company saying how do you expect me to be inclusive and diverse with myself there's only one of me um, so we've got to bear in mind the proportionality of, of what we do and keeping it in scale and making sure that all our measures are relevant and I think that's one of the key things with the risk and compliance environment for me is that you first got to make it real got to make people understand it you've got to make people value it and how do you do that well part, part of it is you link it to revenue and you link it to margin you make the connections real so that it then ties to people's performance and to people's bonuses and you tie it to the KPIs which then also turn to people's annual performance routine and rewards because let's be frank people have a lot to do and the primary thing is keeping the company afloat and growing the company so we're all here for the future so you've got to make those connections real. you've got to make them material you've got to make them matter because then the ESG component and the risk and compliance element of that is um, it is tied to people's thinking at the same level of priority. And so when you start to talk about risk, risk is an upside as well as a downside. There's a risk of something going wrong, but there's also a risk of not achieving extra revenue or the extra sale or the extra contract. So making risk a positive as well as a negative, measuring it on the same scale. And what we try to do is to calibrate our, our risks on both privacy on probability and on consequence, both upside and downside on a consistent scale across negatives and positives. Yeah, after all, if you're, there are two ways of filling a bath of good ESG. One is the tap being turned on, the other is putting the plug in. So let's make sure we look after both. Um, and when you're looking at that, I think it's also important to set a journey. If you don't have a journey on each of the metrics you're looking at, then you'll never know if you're making progress. You can't celebrate the progress you have made, which is critical and encourage people. And you can't also put more encouragement in when it's not working. So we've got, 
on a lot of our um, standards. We've got an appetite, which is where we want to be longer term, and a tolerance, which is where we want to exceed or beat because you know perfection isn't always possible. But then what we're seeking to do is to get a journey, a route to green, if you like, which we can measure to get to the right place on these things. And some of these standards will take longer. You know, for example, environmental standards on buildings in part will depend on when we have the next lease event or the next refurbishment event. So you've got to have goals which are realistic, but that doesn't mean you don't set the goal. It means you make the goal realistic and you link it to performance. So those are the exercises that we're going through at the moment across all of the spheres of what we do, procurement, how we work with clients, how we choose our suppliers, what we do with our colleagues, what we do with our internal real estate and so on. And, it, and it's building those things in stages, but probably the overarching three points, make it real, make it engageable with on a human and a performance level and make it planful so that it actually happens because you've got a timetable to work against. Thanks, Thanks Bruce. Bruce. That's, that's great. And, and I think, you know, you, you've all talked about the sort of employee buy in champions was mentioned a few times, both in terms of risk and, and ESG. Um, and I think, you know, we can have all the policies in the world. I mean, we definitely um, develop policies for clients, but you've got to have the champions that are prepared to bring those to life, haven't you? And make them feel that that's real and, and make it happen. So just just moving us on a bit just to challenges and making that case for ESG investment. We touched on it a little bit. Lisa, you talked earlier a little bit about business value and the importance of that. I think there's a lot of data out there just on business performance being enhanced by companies who have real purpose and integrate this properly. And we've also just tangentially touched upon, but I'm going to deep dive now into it, about our people. So this matters. This really, really matters to our people. So one of the challenges I think around this is balancing the emphasis this gets externally and internally. And Karen, when we chatted, obviously, understandably, you've got lots of examples of how important this is becoming from a recruitment perspective. And I just think I know, you know, the GC isn't potentially controlling the recruitment process across the business, but understanding employee engagement and helping the board to understand that I think is really relevant and it is part of the GC's role in doing that. So I just wondered if you could share a couple of your stories about how you're seeing this come through in the recruitment area. Absolutely. I mean, I, I suppose just to, to sort of, pay, sort of pay, paint a picture to start with, if you consider a, a world where we've got the most live unfilled job vacancies in the UK for 24 years, uh, and then if you look at the results from our latest salary and recruiting guides, where 80% of employers tell us they need to recruit in the next 12 months and 86% are experiencing skill shortages and our lowest percentage of, of people are actually saying, not sure, I might, I might move, I might not. But it's it's you can see the sort of the, the scene that I'm setting there. And, and then ultimately, um, key thing from that in, in terms of survey results was again 86% of employees said that an organization's purpose was really really important to them if they were considering on either staying with their organization or potentially moving to an external organization now that survey was 23,000 people it wasn't a small sample um, and it was people of all different ages so whilst we talk about it being something that millennials care a lot about actually we all care deeply about it um, so that, that's the sort of you know, the, the back drop to it um, and to give one practical example um, that I think I did share with you Ricky who is an individual who is a, a professionally qualified accountant not legal but an accountant um, who had four job offers on the table and for general interest that's not unusual these days out there in the in the professional job market but four very different base financials would, were very very different and without going into the actual numbers, um, the individual took the third lowest base salary offer and it was £7,000 lower than the top offer. So not a small amount of money. Um, and the reason there was, was two reasons. One was there was a little bit more in terms of hybrid and flexible working. But the main reason was how compelling the organisation's purpose was, their, their ESG um, and, and, and how they put that across as a narrative through the looking at an advert perspective, the interviewing and, and onboarding you know, process of, of, of getting that offer out. And I think that's really telling. I can't really wrap it up more than that to say that's the difference it's making for people out there, but not just talent attraction, importantly, talent retention as well, because my other quick second story was when we really, um, from our chief executive globally, set out to say, right, we really need to do better in terms of safeguarding our natural environment. These are our goals. This is what we're going to do. We're all going to play our part. Um, and I got to see confidentially 
actually some of the responses back from employees all around the world. And one employee said, thank goodness, you know, this was the thing that might have made me consider leaving because we weren't really doing anything about it. Uh, and now I've got a reason to stay. Wow. I and mean, that's quite, quite powerful, isn't it? And I think we're all seeing that. Lucy, are you seeing similar things at HS1? Definitely. I mentioned uh, I mentioned earlier that through recent recruitment exercises, we're seeing that sustainability is very much a focus point for candidates. Literally every single candidate that I've interviewed has been onto our website, has had a look at our sustainability strategy and, and asked questions about it. And also we're looking at staff turnover generally and retention and completely agree with everything that Karen's had to say. It's it's so important. I don't think any business can get away for much longer with not putting a real focus on ESG if they want to retain good staff. I think it is the role then, isn't it, of the GC to just keep that on the board agenda because you've got the CEO running the, the growth strategy, just reminding them to keep those two aligned because of the, you know how important it is and what business value it can create. And we've talked about obviously employees, we've talked a little bit about investors, customers and clients um, also care about this. Um, and I think increasingly, um, Lisa, you talked about the um, partnership you've had, I think not with a, I think with a supplier rather than a, a customer, but I think that collaboration is going to be increasingly important as we move forward. But one of the dilemmas I think is, um, I think, Customers, clients are wanting us to do this, but I don't think they're prepared to pay <laughs> to pay anymore for what they're getting. I don't know, Lisa, whether that's something that's come up within Komatsu and, you know, in your role, how you're seeing that um, play out, because I think that's going to be a debate that will will roll on for a while. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, yes, and the, the agreement I was talking about was actually was us with a customer. So again, it was them not expecting a lot of us, not necessarily for any extra um income i think um i think the way to deal with that we, we are absolutely seeing it as a challenge and it, there is a balancing act there i mean for us to be a good corporate citizen we have to be a profitable organization that can contribute so um you know so we have to find that balance i think things like partnering together to develop strategies and and having kpis that are um realistic but but are actually put on both organisations, not just one, rebalances that that relationship. You, you do really need to feel with ESG that it is um, that both parties are contributing and are going to to gain. I think that's if you start to feel like all the pressure's on you to do it all um, with no sort of I guess compensation, but there's no there's no emphasis on the other party. Then I think that becomes. Uh, a lot more challenging to, to be able to get that off the ground. And I think that's something to bear in mind when you are the supplier, so when you're talking to your customers, but also equally when you're talking to your suppliers, because they're going to be feeling the same pressures that you feel. So I think, you know, it's it's having that mentality of this is a collaborative approach. We're going to need, we have expectations that we want you to meet, but let's work together to make sure that it's not, that, that it's an achievable resource um, allocation for both of us. Yeah, I think I think that makes a lot of sense. And we were talking actually with um, some house builders and kind of about their supply chain. Obviously, people don't want to pay any more for their houses, but some of the things that are having to go into those houses now making it more expensive and having that sensible conversation up the supply chain, often led by the GC and company secretary, actually, to bring everyone onto that that page together. I think obviously commercial tension in there, but really critical that it keeps happening. Bruce, I think you wanted to just bring something into that conversation. Yes, thank you. So I think it, this goes back to the in-house legal component of the GC's role very strongly because, you know, one of the core things about this is don't promise what you can't deliver. Um, and uh, when you're looking at often three, five, ten year framework agreements or something that might end up with that with extensions, you, you're making a commitment to these sort of standards. How are you going to make sure that's translated into your own organisation's performance? How is it going to be locked into what your own organisation does so that you don't find yourself inadvertently in breach of a commitment that you've made several years ago to a major partner, both reputationally and contractually? And I think that direction of change in particular around things like modern slavery, minimum wage standards globally, you've only got to look at things, like, for example, what Unilever has done uh, at the beginning of the year in setting a commitment, I think by 2030, that most of its first and second tier supply chain will have minimum wage standards to see where the direction of this is going. 
and this goes back to that horizon scanning point it's not just about the law and the regulation it's also about the trend in contracts and the alignment of your supplier and customer commitments with what you can actually deliver yeah i think huge caveat about what you're signing up to and what's coming down down the line always very difficult to anticipate but i think the role of the gc probably is to navigate the board through some of those decisions karen did you want to come in with a couple of points on that yeah i think it's um when you're sitting at the other end of it as, as operations and looking at the frameworks and going right how do we perform against these 47 measures and what have we got to say from the commercial element which let's not forget it it is a key part of this as well um you know and, and we've just been learning to play to our strengths and that we we won't have something to say on all the 47 and, and as an organization you know we're, we're we're pretty candid and straight talking and and so we'd rather say that and and it it means we we don't win some contracts but when we put something in there we are absolutely 100 percent committed to getting it done and delivering it um and it, it's my big bugbear when things go into contracts and businesses won and, and it's never delivered and and what's the point in that for all of us uh, but certainly the role of, of, of GC in that is is, is very interesting. Um, and I think the other bit it comes to something we talked about earlier, which is helping each other. The reason we're having this session and sharing um, and certainly what we're trying to do and I'm trying to do with um, our, our sort of suppliers and our partnerships is, is kind of well, how can we collectively use these partnerships and introduce people to each other for us all to do better and be better? And I think then that's sometimes at no cost. It's just introductions to networks. Um, and, and that's that's just another I suppose a bit of a tip really from what I've been learning is how can we use, for example, our partnership with end youth homelessness to help to solve an organisation um, looking to diversify their, their talent pipeline on, on things like social mobility, for example, and how can I make introductions? Yeah, that's really useful. And I think just going back to your earlier point about KPIs, and we've all touched on that, I think the last topic we thought we might cover off and just conscious to try and get that in before we we lose people um how to measure success in this there is absolutely really no, no standard metrics um they are emerging and um, there is company law that protects us in certain areas and um, they're really good to just understand perhaps from each of you and maybe lucy we can start with you what measures you are putting in place and how you are perhaps persuading suppliers investors that this is real and you are doing it and you can demonstrate that there is progress being made. Um, how, how do you do that at HS1? So at HS1, we've continued to measure over this last year, but I have to say we are still on a bit of a journey in terms of how we do this, because as you say, there are no specific standards out there. Everybody's doing things in a different way. Um, I'd encourage people to take a look at our ESG report, um, which will be published on our website. Um, one area that I would say we are still very much in the unknown territory of is how do you measure social impact? So we have a target around social impact and volunteering, and our target is to have 700 volunteering hours per year. And we're working with one of our partners to try and I suppose take some learnings from them. So that's what I would encourage people to do. I don't have any hard fast answers here, but I think again that business partnering with with suppliers, customers to see what others are doing is helpful in, in that respect. And I think you're you're living the values of transparency by saying you don't have all the answers. And I think we can yes. all have some empathy with that. Um, Karen, um at Hayes, how, how are you kind of meeting the challenge of transparency and evidence? I think the, the fact, as I said earlier, that we've got the group sort of overarching and, and they've got really clear goals that we've set out at group level in terms of, you know, even within um, ED&I, you know, our, our female leadership targets and our targets with regards to net, net carbon neutral and, and, and net zero. And, and they're really clear and all of the territories have their part to play in that. Within the um, key performance um, the key strategic priority we've we've got four pillars and in each of those there are literally three to five key things that we've set that are kpis if you like um, and actually lucy it does include you know but well, globally we've 10,600 volunteering days you know is, is is one of those things and 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 then we've got that broken down um to to a, a regional level um, and and territory level so um those are um, things that each senior management team is, is, is accountable for and, and actually getting a number of days through on volunteering is is realistic and tangible um, and they can own it fully from start to finish and, and every one of 
of their members of staff can get involved with it. The global targets are, are, are different, um, but those are that's sort of some of the ways that we're doing it is making it um, sort of baby steps, tick that off, tick that off, do well, tell the story, internalise it. Is, that, is everyone feeling good about that? Are we ready to tell that as an external story? And, and that's that's really key for me. Um, and, and then playing our part in the bigger goals. Um, and, and just as an aside, it's really interesting, uh, you know, in, in terms of the, the discussion around GC today, because if my day job is is running our accountancy and finance recruitment business. And of course, um, your accountants are also getting drawn into this in terms of risk management and governance and, and strategy um, and, and the metrics and measures. So it's been fascinating today. Yeah, and we've, we, we ourselves are grasp, grappling, Bruce, aren't we, at board level with the metrics we're going to put around around this around area. This area and volunteering, volunteering days is days one, of, one, of, one of ours. <laughs> I don't know yes. if you want to comment, Bruce, from an IM. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, I think in brief, because of timing, we're, we're very much in a similar vein generally in terms of looking at everything from UNSDG goals to through to um, how we build KPIs, which are of equal weight to our performance goals in to our balanced scorecard. And, you know, looking at how we do each of the, the three sub pillars under our two co pillars of sustainability and inclusion. And when you come to the people side, yeah, I'm particularly interested in this because for getting the chart, the volunteered hours up, especially skilled volunteering, where people are using their their own technical discipline um, to help an organisation that wouldn't otherwise be able to afford it, is something which we're particularly passionate about. Obviously, it's easier for lawyers because of lawyers pro bono, but we're also looking at it with our accounting and finance folk, internally our HR folk, and so on, and getting that right. And that's also part of what we're looking at at the moment as we refresh our charity partnerships. Uh, this is our 25th anniversary of our charity foundation this year and we're looking at how we remodel the way we work with charities nationally and locally to see if we can actually make it not, not just about donating money but also about donating usable skills and experience and uh, that for us is a work in progress but one that we're getting a lot of engagement from our colleagues across the business on because it's meaning that they can use their time to put more value into things that matter. Great, Bruce, thank you. I, I think we're just coming to the end now of, of the session. Just just before I come to each of you, just with perhaps one takeaway each. I think what just to summarise, I think what we've heard today is this is a step by step journey. We're all at different stages on that. I think the role of the GC and the company secretary has changed quite irreversibly. I don't think we're going to go back. This is a key part of, of our function in terms of how we operate and how we can help the board to not only, only horizon scan, Bruce, as you've talked about, but how to translate that locally, how to take global strategies and embed those across the organisation. We've talked about champions. We've talked about that alignment to your own business values, knowing what those are and being realistic and authentic around that. Um, and also the commercial side, that if we get this right, there is commercial gain, there is business value and persuading the board of that, keeping the keeping that cognizant and forefront of mind in the board as they develop their strategy, but also reminding them to come back and not losing sight, I think, of the GC's day job, which is the governance, the strategy, the framework, the measures, um, all of which are emerging and developing quickly, probably not as quickly as we would like. I think we'd all like a little bit more guidance on how we measure this and make it more transparent, but it will emerge. And I think just having our eye to that and making sure that what we commit to is doable, realisable and, as I say, authentic. I think there's been so much in that. I think it's been a really, really great discussion so thank you to each of you and before we go in the last minute I'm just going to come to each of you just one thing that you would give as advice to take away Lucy if I can start with you do what you say you're going to do and be authentic brilliant thank you Karen uh, mine has to be about talent um, and, and obviously making sure everyone on this session will have an organization that's doing something well so don't beat yourself about what you're not doing um, do as you say, you say do, do, what you, do what you say you're going to do and make sure you have a narrative on it and you articulate it to your talent and the talent you want to hire. That's great. And Lisa? Yeah, I think understand where your organisation is in the journey and don't try and jump seven steps ahead too early. You've got to take people on that journey with you, you know, and you've got to try and um, get their buy-in so that step by step it does become properly embedded in the organisation. Yeah, brilliant. Step by step to maturity. And Bruce? I think the last piece of the equation is make sure that the governance and the processes work and the contracts are actually doing what they say they do so that we can actually help our businesses to deliver what we want to deliver. Yeah, that's, yeah, great. that's great. Great, great advice, advice from everybody. everybody. Thank you. Um, and I have just been reminded just to 
remind you all there is a feedback server that's been emailed out. We would really like your feedback, not just because it gives us a, a chance to improve, but also focus on some topics for the future, which will be of help to you. So thanks again to the panel. It's great. Thank you to the audience for staying with us and listening. I hope that was helpful. I hope it gave you some sound bites um, and we hope to see you on a future event. Thank you very much. <laughs>